a Wikivide Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Cragside Cragside is a Victorian country house near the town of Rothbury in Northumberland, England. It was the home of William Armstrong, 1st Baron Armstrong, founder of the Armstrong Whitworth Armaments Firm, an industrial magnate, scientist, philanthropist, and inventor of the hydraulic crane and the Armstrong gun. Armstrong also displayed his inventiveness in the domestic sphere, making Cragside the first house in the world to be lit using hydroelectric power. The entire estate was technologically advanced. The architect of the house, Richard Norman Shaw, wrote that it was equipped with wonderful hydraulic machines that do all sorts of things. In the grounds, Armstrong built dams and created lakes to power a sawmill, a water-powered laundry, early versions of a dishwasher, and a dumb waiter, a hydraulic lift and a hydroelectric rotisserie. In 1887, Armstrong was raised to the peerage, the first engineer or scientist to be ennobled. He took his title from the name of his house, to become Baron Armstrong, of Cragside. The original building was a small shooting lodge which Armstrong built between 1862 and 1864. In 1869, he employed the architect Richard Norman Shaw to enlarge Cragside, in two phases of work between 1869 and 1882. They transformed the house into a northern Neuschwanstein. The result was described by the architect and writer Harry Stuart Goodhart Rendell as one of the most dramatic compositions in all architecture. Armstrong filled the house with a significant art collection. He and his wife were patrons of many 19th-century British artists. Cragside became an integral part of Armstrong's commercial operations, honored guests under Armstrong's roof, including the Shah of Persia. The King of Siam and two future Prime Ministers of Japan, were also customers for his commercial undertakings. Following Armstrong's death in 1900, his heirs struggled to maintain the house and estate. In 1910, the best of Armstrong's art collection was sold off, and by the 1970s, in an attempt to meet inheritance tax, plans were submitted for large-scale residential development of the estate. In 1971 the National Trust asked the architectural historian Mark Gerard to compile a gazetteer of the most important Victorian houses in Britain which the Trust should seek to save should they ever be sold. Gerard placed Cragside at the top of the list. In 1977, the house was acquired by the Trust with the aid of a grant from the National Land Fund. A Grade I listed building since 1953, Cragside has been open to the public since 1979. William Armstrong William Armstrong was born on 26 November 1810 in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, the son of a corn merchant. Trained as a solicitor, he moved to London before he was 20, returning to Newcastle. In 1835 he met and married Margaret Ramshaw, the daughter of a builder, a keen amateur scientist. Armstrong began to conduct experiments in both hydraulics and electricity. In 1847, he abandoned the law for manufacturing, and established W. G. Armstrong and Company at a site at Elswick, outside Newcastle. By the 1850s, with his design for the Armstrong gun, Armstrong laid the foundations for an armaments firm that would, before the end of the century, see Krupp as its only world rival. He established himself as a figure of national standing. His work supplying artillery to the British Army was seen as an important response to the failures of Britain's forces during the Crimean War. In 1859, he was knighted and made engineer of rifled ordnance, becoming the principal supplier of armaments to both the Army and the Navy. Shooting Box 1862-1865 Armstrong had spent much of his childhood at Rothbury, escaping from industrial Newcastle for the benefit of his often poor health. He returned to the area in 1862, not having taken a holiday for over 15 years. On a walk with friends, Armstrong was struck by the attractiveness of the site for a house. Returning to Newcastle, he bought a small parcel of land and decided to build a modest house on the side of a moorland crag. He intended a house of eight or ten rooms and a stable for a pair of horses. The house was completed in the mid-1860s by an unknown architect a two-story shooting box of little architectural distinction. It was nevertheless constructed and furnished to a high standard. Fairy Palace 1869-1900 Armstrong's architect for Cragside's expansion was the Scott R. Norman Shaw. 
Shaw had begun his career in the office of William Byrne, and had later studied under Anthony Salvin and George Edmund Street. Salvin had taught him the mastery of internal planning which was essential for the design of the large and highly variegated houses which the Victorian wealthy craved. Salvin and Street had taught him to understand the Gothic revival. At only 24, he won the Reaper Gold Medal and Travelling Studentship. The connection between Armstrong and Shaw was made when Armstrong purchased a picture, Prince Hal taking the crown from his father's bedside by John Colcott Horsley, which proved too large to fit into his townhouse in Jesmond, Newcastle. Horsley, a friend of both, recommended that Shaw design an extension to the banqueting hall Armstrong had previously built in the grounds. When this was completed in 1869, Shaw was asked to propose enlargements and improvements to the shooting lodge Armstrong had had built at Rothbury some four years earlier. This was the genesis of the transformation of the house between 1869 and 1884. Over the next 30 years, Cragside became the center of Armstrong's world. Reminiscing years later, in his old age, he remarked, Had there been no Cragside, I shouldn't be talking to you today for it has been my very life. The architectural historian Andrew Saint records that Shaw sketched out the whole design for the future fairy palace in a single afternoon, while Armstrong and his guests were out on a shooting party. After this rapid initial design, Shaw worked on building the house for over 20 years. The long building period, and Armstrong's piecemeal, and changeable, approach to the development of the house, and his desire to retain the original shooting lodge at its core, occasionally led to tensions between client and architect, and to a building that lacks an overall unity. Armstrong changed the purpose of several rooms as his interests developed, and the German architectural historian Hermann Muthesius, writing just after Armstrong's death in 1900, noted that, the house did not find the unqualified favor with Shaw's followers that his previous works had done, nor did it entirely satisfy. Nevertheless, Shaw's abilities, as an architect and as a manager of difficult clients, ensured that Cragside was composed with memorable force. As well as being Armstrong's home, Cragside acted as an enormous display case for his ever-expanding art collection. The best of his pictures were hung in the drawing room, but Shaw also converted the museum into a top-lit picture gallery. Pride of place was given to John Everett Miller's Chill October, bought by Armstrong at the Samuel Mendel sale at Christie's in 1875. Armstrong also bought Millie Jephthah's daughter at the Mendel sale. Both were sold in the 1910 sale. Chill October is now in the private collection of Andrew Lloyd Webber, and Jephthah's daughter is held by the National Museum Cardiff. Cragside was also an important setting for Armstrong's commercial activities. The architectural writer Simon Jenkins records, Japanese, Persian, Siamese and German dignitaries paid court to the man who equipped their armies and built their navies. In his 2005 book Landmarks of Britain Cliverslit notes visits with the same purpose from the Crown Prince of Afghanistan and the Shah of Persia. The Shah Nazar Eldin visited in July 1889, and the Afghan Prince Nasrullah Khan in June 1895. Armstrong's biographer Henrietta Heald mentions two future Prime Ministers of Japan, Kato Takaki and Sato Makoto. Among a steady stream of Japanese industrialists, naval officers, politicians and royalty who inscribe their names in the Cragside Visitor's Book, the Chinese diplomat Li Hung Chang visited in August 1896. King Shula Longkorn of Siam was staying in August 1897, when activity at the Elzik Works was disrupted by a bitter strike over pay and dowers. In August 1884 the Prince and Princess of Wales made a three-day visit to Cragside. It was the peak of Armstrong's social career. The royal arrival at the house was illuminated by 10,000 lamps, and a vast array of Chinese lanterns hung in the trees on the estate. Fireworks were launched from six balloons, and a great bonfire was lit on the Simonside Hills. On the second day of their visit, the prince and princess traveled to Newcastle, to formally open the grounds of Armstrong's old house, Jesmond Dean, which he had by then donated to the city as a public park. Three years later, at the Golden Jubilee of Queen Victoria, Armstrong was ennobled as Baron Armstrong of Cragside, and became the first engineer and the first scientist to be granted a peerage. Among many other celebrations, he was awarded the freedom of the city of Newcastle. In his vote of thanks, 
the mayor noted that one in four of the entire population of the city was employed directly by Armstrong, or by companies, over which he presided. Armstrong's heirs, 1900 present. Armstrong died at Cragside on 27 December 1900, aged 90, and was buried beside his wife in the churchyard at Rothbury. His gravestone carries an epitaph. His scientific attainments gained him a worldwide celebrity, and his great philanthropy the gratitude of the poor, Cragside, and Armstrong's fortune, were inherited by his great-nephew, William Watson Armstrong. Watson Armstrong lacked Armstrong's commercial acumen and a series of poor financial investments led to the sale of much of the Great Heart Collection in 1910. In 1972, the death of Watson Armstrong's heir, William John Montague Watson Armstrong, saw the house and estate threatened by large-scale residential development, intended to raise the money to pay a large inheritance tax bill. In 1971, when advising the National Trust on the most important Victorian houses to be preserved for the nation in the event of their sale, Mark Gerard had identified Cragside as the top priority. A major campaign saw the house and grounds acquired by the Trust in 1977, with the aid of a grant from the National Land Fund. In 2007, Cragside reopened after undergoing an 18-month refurbishment program that included rewiring the whole house. It has become one of the most visited sites in northeast England, with some 227,062 visitors in 2016. The trust continues restoration work, allowing more of the house to be displayed. Armstrong's electrical room in which he conducted experiments on electrical charges towards the end of his life, was reopened in 2016. The experiments had led to the publication in 1897 of Armstrong's last work, Electrical Movement in Air and Water, illustrated with remarkable early photographs by his friend John Warsnop. The Trust continues the reconstruction of the wider estate, with plans to redevelop Armstrong's glass houses, including the Palm House, the Ferneries and the Orchid House. Architecture and Description Cragside is an example of Shaw's Duda revival style. The Pevsno Architectural Guide for Northumberland called it the most dramatic Victorian mansion in the north of England. The entrance front was described by Harry Stuart Goodhart Rendell as one of the most dramatic compositions in all architecture, and the architectural historian James Stevens Curl regarded the house as an extraordinarily accomplished picturesque composition. Criticism focuses on the building's lack of overall coherence. In the National Trust Book of the English House, a slit and powers describe the house as large and meandering, and the architectural critics Dixon and Muthesius write that the plan rambles along the hillside. Saint is even more dismissive, for him, the plan of Cragside is little better than a straggle. The half timbering above the entrance has also been criticized as unfaithful to the vernacular tradition of the Northeast. Shaw would have been unconcerned, desiring it for romantic effect. He reached out for it like an artist reaching out for a tube of color. The architectural historian J. Mordaunt Crook considers Cragside to be one of the very few country houses built by the Victorian commercial plutocracy that was truly avant garde or trend setting. In his study, The Rise of the Nouveau Riches, Crook contends that many new money donors were too domineering, and generally chose second-rate architects, as these tended to be more pliant, allowing the clients to get their own way, rather than those of the first rank such as Shaw. The Rhenish flavor of the house makes a notable contrast with the country house that was almost contemporaneous with Cragside, the Villa Hugel constructed by Armstrong's greatest rival, Alfred Krupp. While Armstrong's Northumbrian fastness drew on Teutonic inspirations, his German competitor designed and built a house that was an exercise in neoclassicism. The location for the house was described by Mark Gerard as a lunatic site. Pevsner and Richmond call both the setting and the house Wagnerian. The ledge on which it stands is narrow, and space for the repeated expansions could only be found by dynamiting the rock face behind or by building upwards. Such challenges only drove Armstrong on, and overcoming the technical barriers to construction gave him great pleasure. His task was made easier by the use of the workforce, and the technology of the Elzik works. The architectural historian Jill Franklin notes that the vertiginous fall of the site is so steep that the drawing room, on a level with the first floor landing at the front of the house, meets the rock face at the back. 
Jenkins describes the plan of the house as simpler than the exterior suggests. The majority of the reception rooms are located on the ground floor, as are the accompanying service rooms. The exception is the large extension shore added to the southeast from 1882. This includes the drawing room, completed for the visit of the Prince and Princess of Wales, in August 1884. The house has been a Grey Dye listed building since 21 October 1953, the listing citing in Ter Eliowitz, largely complete Victorian interior. The architectural correspondent of the Times, Marcus Binney, who was closely involved in the campaign to bring Cragside to the National Trust, noted the historic importance of this virtually untouched interior, with its collections of furnishings, furniture, and fine and decorative arts, with work by many notable designers of the period, including William Morris, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, Philip Webb and Edward Byrne Jones. Pevsner notes that the art collection demonstrated what was permissible to the Victorian nobleman in the way of erotica. Kitchen, service rooms and Turkish bath. The kitchen is large by Victorian standards and forms a considerable apartment with the butler's pantry. It displays Armstrong's technical ingenuity to the full, having a dumb waiter and a spit both run on hydraulic power. An electric gong announced mealtimes. For the visit of Edward and Alexandra, Armstrong brought in the royal caterers, Gunters, who used the kitchen to prepare an eight-course menu which included oysters, turtle soup, stuffed turbot, venison, grouse, peaches in maraschino jelly, and brown bread ice cream. Off the kitchen, under the library, is a Turkish bath suite, an unusual item in a Victorian private house. The writer Michael Hall suggests that the bath, with its plunge pool, was intended as much to demonstrate Armstrong's copious water supply as for actual use. As was often the case, Armstrong also found practical application for his pleasures. Steam generated by the Turkish bath supported the provision of heating for the house. Library and Dining Room Gerard describes the library as one of the most sympathetic Victorian rooms in England. It belongs to the first phase of Shaw's construction work and was completed in 1872. It has a large bay window which gives views out over the bridge and the glen. The room is half-panelled in oak and the fireplace includes fragments of Egyptian onyx, collected during Armstrong's visit to the country in 1872. The library originally contained some of Armstrong's best pictures, although most were rehung in the gallery or drawing room. Following Shaw's later building campaign of the 1880s, and then sold in 1910, ten years after Armstrong's death, the highlight was Albert Joseph Moore's Follow My Leader, dating from 1872. Andrew Saint considers the room Shaw's greatest domestic interior. The dining room off the library contains a Gothic fireplace with an ingle nook. A portrait of Armstrong by Henry Hetherington Emerson shows him sitting in the ingle nook with his dogs under a carved inscription on the mantelpiece reading East or West. Hames Best. The stained glass in the windows of the ingle nook is by William Morris and other glass from Morris and Company to designs by Rossetti, Byrne Jones, Webb and Ford Maddox Brown, was installed in the library, gallery and upper stairs. Owl Suite The Owl Rooms were constructed in the first building campaign and formed a suite for important guests. Their name derives from the carved owls that decorate the woodwork and the bed. The room is panelled in American black walnut, the same wood from which the tester bed is carved. Saint notes that Shaw was proud of the design displaying a further owl bed in an exhibition in 1877 the prince and princess of wales occupied the rooms during their stay at cragside in 1884 other bedrooms notably the yellow and white rooms were hung with wallpaper by william morris including early versions of his fruit and bird and trellis designs the wallpapers were reprinted using the original printing blocks and rehung in the national trust's renovations Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you like to know more?